and welcome to Tech Law Talks. I am Anthony Diana, a member of Reed Smith's Tech and Data Group. In each episode of this podcast, we will discuss cutting edge issues on technology, data, and the law. We will provide practical observations on a wide variety of technology and data topics to give you quick and actionable tips to address the issues you are dealing with every day. Welcome back to Tech Law Talks. My name is Kyle Marks. I'm an associate here at Reed Smith. Today, we're actually taking a brief break from our e-communications podcast series to discuss another crucially important financial services topic, how to identify bad actors and what to do about them. So financial services firms typically handle lots of assets, including cash. And handling and managing significant assets comes with great responsibility and a large amount of risk. Those risks take various forms, including market risks, macroeconomic risks, and even geopolitical risks that must be mitigated. Many of these risks are are actually not due to the actions of any given individual or even group of individual, but are simply due to the fact that financial firms are economic actors in today's world. The focus of this podcast will be the risk and exposures posed by bad actors and the means and strategies firms must consider and develop to mitigate them. Today, I'm joined by Kieran Shomashekra and John Lukansky, who are partners here at Reed Smith, and Tiffany Magri from Smarsh. So the first and most fundamental question is, what are bad actors? John? Thank you, Kyle. The straightforward, simple answer is that anyone can be a bad actor, right? It could be the customers of the firm. It could be employees of the firm. It could be third parties who are acting nefariously. I think all the bad actors share, you know, a common trait. They're all acting with intent to engage in malfeasance, uh, whether it's a violation of a policy, a procedure, or a law. They all share that common feature. But, you know, we have to not lose sight of the fact that bad actors could also include enablers of those folks. To a, a certain extent, you know, people who know they're doing things that they shouldn't have been doing, not acting with the intent to fraud anybody, but they're nevertheless acting in a way that, you know, they know is not right. And that causes harm to either the firm or it's the firm's customers. So short answer for you, Kyle, is everybody could be a bad actor, but I think they all share a common trait, which is, you know, the intent to inflect some sort of malfeasance. Great. So Kieran, what type of conduct do we typically see from these bad actors? The conduct we're talking about, Kyle, is pretty broad. It could be any illegal, fraudulent, unethical, or really other conduct an individual or group of individuals engage in to take advantage of others for their own benefit, right? And and the most obvious scenario in which this happens is, is theft or misappropriation, where one party is figuring out and trying to figure out a way to take the assets of another party and and very often financial services firms whether they're broker dealers or banks or or other firms that handle customer assets are are in the middle the scope and range of this conduct is almost unlimited even as it just pertains to the financial services space now, law enforcement historically law enforcement regulators firms themselves been in the position of constantly trying to keep up and catch up with the newest latest and greatest tactics including technological tactics that bad actors use. You know, what we're talking about is someone who engages in intentional or at least reckless conduct, not someone who's making a mistake. But that said, as John mentioned, enablers are folks who potentially do not follow policies and procedures and and, and either willingly or unwittingly uh, assist bad actors in carrying out their, their, their conduct. Those enablers, those individuals are are an area of serious focus and need to be an area of serious focus for financial services firms. Just to run down a few examples of the types of conduct we're talking about, like I said, the most obvious conduct is theft or misappropriation of assets, but that can break into various categories, right? You can have misappropriation by a third party of customer of your firm's customer's assets. You can have misappropriation by the customer of a third party's assets through the use of your firm's accounts. We've seen cases in which, uh, unfortunately, employees or contractors associated with a firm, you know, for example, set up fraudulent accounts in the names of certain customers or third parties in order to use those accounts to transfer and misappropriate funds. And and in a lot of these scenarios, if not all of them, um, 
the firms themselves, companies themselves and their employees are used by these bad actors to, in some form, facilitate uh, their goals. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, you have the fa- you have you have the example of straight third party fraud, too. Right. You have a customer might come in or call you and say, hey, I, I got a call and, and someone asked me to wire fifty thousand dollars to this account in the promise of a great investment or in order to support some sympathetic cause. And firms have to be on the lookout for the proverbial Nigerian prince case in which customers are often duped into parting with their hard-earned money you know, in response to a scam. So the conduct is broad, the scope and the breadth of actors who can be bad actors is broad, and you know, firms really have to take a holistic view in trying to mitigate the risk that's posed by bad actors. Tiffany, can you walk us through some of the tools you've seen firms use to identify and investigate, you know, this unlawful, unethical, bad actor conduct? Absolutely. There's a lot of great tools out there and platforms that you can capture and retain and help really provide you some great supervision capabilities when it comes to e-commerce, or e-communications, trading, and other compliance obligations. They're pretty effective in allowing these surveillance tools to be an integral part of identifying bad actors which frankly is a requirement for a lot of the regulated industries. And so we've seen a massive rise in the amount of communication channels and systems people are using to identify these potential misbehaviors has really become crucial in mitigating and figuring out ways to, to mitigate risk misconduct that's happening in the industry. So it's really about making some of this data that you're capturing and, and retaining work for you and how you can look for red flags and different things within those communications to really identify those that misconduct. And we see that even expanding a little bit outside of the regulated industries to include other types of businesses with regards to HR or information risk or IP leaks and helping people find ways to detect things like taking off channel communications in places where we know they're, they're going to go and hide like discord or signal and looking for those breadcrumbs where those activities may be happening. Other code of conduct things we've seen a lot of on some of these surveillance channels is things like bullying or text harassment. There's been a rise in that in channels we've seen such as Teams and Zoom and Slack. And then even being aware of other conduct such as inappropriate behaviors that might be happening within your firm or even uh, as part of your gift and entertainment policy, finding things in there that might be problems for your for your company. We've seen a drastic increase in the rise of how people are using AI and possibly natural language processing to really spot some of these bad behaviors. It's much more equipped to address a lot of these behaviors and designed to really ID patterns of behavior as opposed to just looking at a single phrase or a word and, and you know, as you're looking at just like one communication. So we've seen a dramatic decrease in the number of false positives it's marsh as well as an increase in the true positives. So you can really get to those communications and focus on what you need to be focusing on and some of those behaviors. Tiffany, do you, do you find that the surveillance tools that Smarsh provides or where you've seen elsewhere in the market, are they, are they adaptable to individual firms and their own risk mitigation functions, compliance functions? In other words, you know, are they flexible enough to be tailored to a particular firm's needs as opposed to being kind of like a one one size fits all solution? Absolutely. You can tailor each of your different surveillance measures within the within the different platforms to really figure out, you know, what am I looking for? Whether it's a lexicon based search or if you're use, like, using some of the more advanced AI technologies, you can look for different patterns or different words or different verb or verbiage usage. And, one big thing we've seen a lot of is people uh, model- modality hopping. So going from text to email to Teams and having that all in one centralized communication channel can really help you identify those patterns across different modalities as you're looking at the way one person is communicating versus the different talk tracks on different channels. So a lot of these can really be customized to one, look for what you're really trying to focus on is, is what that bad behavior might be, and two, look at it across different communication channels so you can more easily spot patterns. Right, right. Yeah, and, and that bad behavior and the use of surveillance tools to look at communications, those tools have, have historically been a really productive means by which firms can can at least identify some red flags and then kind of follow up on those red flags Surveillance tools provide the means by which firms can first identify an issue or potential bad conduct by a bad actor, 
that they need to pull the string on and and follow up on. And John, maybe you can talk a little bit about firms' duty to investigate and what really they ought to do when a red flag arises. Sure, sure. So every regulated firm cannot put its head in the sand. They have a duty to investigate. You have a duty to supervise. You have a duty to pull on that string if you know that there or suspect there to be something you know bad going on, a problem with whether it's you know fraud, whether it's a system, whether it's a uh, it's a practice, a product. If it's there, you have the duty to investigate. Some firms do better jobs than others. Some firms know what they need to do and and will never you know will never be questioned about you know, the steps they took in order to, you know, investigate. But every firm has the obligation to investigate red flags. In terms of who they have to investigate and what what causes them to to have to, you know, pull on the red flag, it, it could come from a lot of different, you know, things. It could come from employee certifications. You know, every firm requires their employees to submit on an annual basis you know, responses to certain questions that are driven by regulatory obligations, whether the employee is an outside business activity, whether they've had any liens or judgments, whether there's been any bankruptcies, whether they have any private securities transactions, and there's a whole list of items that you could go through. You know, firms use those to detect red flags. There's also, you know, the question, you know, comes up whether activity by a person outside the firm that affects firm business, you know, whether it's a a third party fraudster that affects, you know, the account of a customer, whether that would, you know, give rise to the firm's obligation to undertake a a review. And, you know, my response is it it should, right? If the rule is you have a duty to supervise the happenings at your business, and nevertheless, a third party was able to fraud your customer and somehow take their funds, you should dig in. I mean, you don't know at that point, whether an employee was complicit, whether a system failed, whether a system could be improved. If it affects your business, you have an obligation to dig in. Yeah. And, and you know, the, it's not necessarily just a, a legal or regulatory obligation to investigate bad conduct. It's also a risk mitigation just for your business, right? In, in the instance of a third party fraudster who is taking advantage of an elderly customer whose account is in your shop, if that actually happens, what are the chances that that same third party fraudster did not also uh, attempt to at least, or maybe in fact, take advantage of another elderly or vulnerable customer within your firm, whether there are regulatory obligations to report that type of activity and independent of any obligation to report that activity as a firm, you'd want to know whether your customers are being taken advantage of both to protect them, but also, you know, to mitigate your own risk. At the end of the day, if you're aware of a, a, a customer whose assets have been misappropriated by a third party or, God forbid, an employee, and you don't investigate that activity thoroughly enough and it repeats itself in another account, well, you can be sure that regulators are going to look at your shop with a little bit more scrutiny next time with respect to that issue. And you know, you also face the risk of civil liability, right? In litigation and arbitration claims, the more frequently something happens and it's not mitigated by the firm, chances are that makes a better case for a claimant or a plaintiff. So I I really like what you were on to there with customer remediation and really looking at some of those different red flags when you're doing your surveillance is so important, especially during a time where there might be a recession or we might be seeing a down market and there's just a dramatic increase in customer complaints. So I think firms should really pay attention to looking at some of those different messages that are coming from those external people to also help identify things that could be going internally on in your in your business with misconduct. Yeah. I, and Tiffany, what you said about down markets, I mean, listen, when everything is going great and everybody's making enough of money, that covers over a lot and hides a lot. It's, it's when things start to recede and customers start looking for their money, you know, and, 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 and bad people or reps who maybe have been operating some sort of Ponzi scheme or they gave bad advice. You know, those things are you put sunshine on them when the market recedes. You know, you see a lot more. Again, you know, when everything's going great, you know, you don't see a lot. But when, when things start receding, it, it, it definitely clears things up a little bit. 
Yeah, we've seen a number of cases, both in the regulatory world, but also just in arbitration and customer complaints where, you know, a, a, there, there's been all kinds of sales practice violations uh, in an account for several years. But during an up market, the customer's generally looking at the bottom line and the balance on the account every month. And as long as that balance is either increasing or relatively stable over time, not necessarily looking into the transactions in the account or any, you know, peeling back the onion a little bit to get some more details. But once the market, you know, once the market goes the other way, sometimes customers find out there are a lot more leverage than they thought they were or that they have a margin account and they didn't think they had a margin account or they're invested in a bunch of, you know, high yield, what some might call junk bonds and, and junk bond funds. And they didn't think that they were invested in those funds. But it's the downturn in the market and the subsequent downturn in the in the account balance that triggers the complaint. Often those types of issues, if they're caught on the front end through surveillance, through supervision, will save your firm a lot of heartache and money once the market turns, as it always will, and produces a slew of customer complaints and, and claims. Great. Thanks, all. Anyone else with any particular examples they wanted to share or uh, anything else to add before we wrap this up for the day? Well, I think it's worth discussing, you know, just some other, in, in addition to the front end steps, I know we touched on remediation a little bit, but in addition to the front end supervision and surveillance that firms need to do around their businesses to look out for these types of issues, what else can firms do to kind of help mitigate the risk and exposure coming out of the conduct of bad actors. Well, you know, a lot of times firms have regulatory obligations of disclosure if they do find conduct by an employee or an associated person in the brokerage world. But again, even absent those uh, those obligations to disclose to a regulator, you probably want to do an internal investigation to figure out the scope of the problem, even if it is, we believe, or you believe it's limited to third parties and not firm employees. You may want to assess potential customer remediation. You want to look into what other accounts could have been harmed by similar or the same conduct, and then perhaps assess your policies and procedures and, and controls for, for, for whatever the issue was in that particular case. If it was a vulnerable customer who was taken advantage of, you know, sit down with your risk and compliance and supervision folks and, and try to figure out, hey, what could we have done to try to catch this before it happens? And what can we do to catch other varieties of this before they happen the next time? It's always important to keep a, an ongoing holistic mindset about supervision and, and surveillance and, uh, and risk mitigation. Important for firms to get on the same page within themselves with their risk and compliance folks and to make sure that they get buy-in from their business that some of the measures that they want to put in are worth doing and are worth the cost. I don't know if Tiffany or John, you have anything else to add to that? What I was going to say, Karen, is, is, is everything you said was very important. You know, many years ago, we had a matter that you couldn't dream up uglier facts. And it was an employee fraud case where it had gone on for close to two decades, you know, big numbers. And the, to their credit, the client we represented made a commitment to not only, you know, drill down into the client who was, again, that, that thread, but you know, scoped every account that that, you know, rep had touched and, you know, found way more fraud. And, you know, they had disclosed the matter to their regulators and the regulators got a sense of confidence because the, the firm had done the right thing uh, leading up to their disclosure that the regulators sort of took a hands-off approach and let the firm clean up, you know, its own mess, scope it, and clean it up and then report back to the regulators. And part of it was remediating everything, no questions asked, no pushback, you know, doing the right thing. And, the, and, and they had done such a good job that the regulators essentially said, okay, got it, you know, let's move on. And, and so, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel sometimes when you get into these, you know, massive investigations and, and reviews where there is clear wrongdoing, but, the, the firms have to act in a certain way, right? If you, if it's clear, you can't, you know, you can't be stingy and not remediate. If you, if it's, if it's one, you know, you got to scope to see whether it's two and you got to be honest with yourself. If it's two, then it's probably three. 
And if it's three, then it's, you know, it could be a lot more. So you, and, and you can't just say, okay, well, we looked at one customer and that's it. You know, you have to, you have to do a little bit more than that. And I think if you do all that, you can demonstrate to the regulators that you've done your job in good faith and you've done a good job and a thorough job, they're apt to sort of just say, okay, we couldn't have done any better ourselves. We got it. We're comfortable with what you did and let's move on. I really like that you bring that point up, John, because I think from a practitioner standpoint, we're always a little hesitant to to sell to self report when we need to, and you know, kind of take a hands off approach with regulators to do that. But I think it's I think they've been very clear on the fact that if you know people aren't infallible, if you know if you notice an issue, figure out how to you know go down there and, and and remediate it, and typically they're they're more than willing to help you sift through those things and figure out the best the best way to get through it. So I think I think that's a very valid point for practitioners to remember that although you may not be um, completely out of trouble, that they they're there to help too, as well as you know come in and examine and drop the hammer. I think it's also important. I wanted to bring up one point about when we look at these different supervision and we're looking for different bad actors. There's always a new channel. There's always new communications going on, and just doing attestations and training it may not be enough, right? So how do you search for these things? How do you go back to that supervision and really look through some of these things to get to look up red flags and find possible different channels and things that are always always evolving? So I want to just kind of just circle back on that and try to find ways, you know, of, of really think through what what's the new channel what what's happening am i doing ad hoc searches to look for some of those new things that might be popping up or might be coming up in communication channels that um, people could misbehave on wonderful i'd like to say thank you to all of our speakers today for joining us on this episode of tech law talks tech law talks is a reed smith production our producer is ali mccardle for more information about reed smith's tech and data practice please email techlawtalks at reedsmith.com. You can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and reedsmith.com. And our social media accounts at Reedsmith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. All rights reserved.